Hi, welcome to another episode of the Literary Minute with me, Professor Stephanie Johnson, also known as The Right, W-R-I-T-E, Professor. So this is episode 12, and of course, it's lit. I'll be reading an excerpt from one of my own publications entitled Portraits of Trayvon. I was inspired to create this piece in 2012 in an immediate response to the incident when a young Trayvon Martin was gunned down by neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman. Now the tragedy of Trayvon Martin opened up a significant dialogue in our country regarding matters of just law, dynamics of justice, and how race impacts perspectives regarding both. And uh, shortly after Trayvon's murder, details regarding the incident surfaced as Martin family supporters voiced their outrage at the fact that this shooter, George Zimmerman, had not been arrested. Now, concerned with Zimmerman, a grown man, and armed, and Trayvon, an unarmed teenager, disgruntled Martin supporters held vigils and rallies demanding that George Zimmerman be arrested. Now in my publication, Portraits of Trayvon, what you will find are images of Martin supporters at the various rallies and vigils that took place that protested the injustice surrounding the entire situation and the fact again that the Sanford, Florida police failed to arrest George Zimmerman immediately following the murder of Trayvon Martin. And of course, um, Zimmerman was eventually arrested, as we know, um, after the pressure of these concerned citizens swelled into what I refer to as a large tidal wave, dripping our country in an emotional call to action that was reminiscent and characteristic of those American socio-political movements that took place during the 1960s. So you may be asking, what's the relevance? Why am I bringing this up now? Well, mainly for two reasons. Recently in the news, there were reports that uh, George Zimmerman became upset with uh, Jay-Z because apparently um, Jay-Z is working on a documentary uh, about the incident with Trayvon Martin. Not only that, supposedly or reportedly or allegedly, there were people who were trying to contact and uh, communicate with members of George Zimmerman's family that upset George Zimmerman. And in response to that, George Zimmerman reportedly, allegedly, sent threats or made uh, threatening remarks about confronting Jay-Z, beating him up, and feeding him to the alligators because he knows how to deal with people who mess with him and he probably used an expletive. However, the second and more important reason for me having this discussion and sharing my publication is because Trayvon's birthday is coming up. Trayvon was born, or his birthday is on February 5th. So around this time, we're in that season, um, his family has an annual remembrance gala, a full weekend of activities down in Miami, Florida. So I wanted to make sure to get information out about that, which you can find at TrayvonMartinFoundation.org. Now, George Zimmerman was not found guilty um, in the trial for what took place uh, with Trayvon Martin, but since that trial, he has appeared in the news consistently, and this recent incident was just another uh, episode for him. Now, he has been in the news for receiving a traffic ticket out in Texas, for supposedly assisting a distressed motorist in Sanford, Florida, for his divorce from his wife, also for allegedly assaulting his girlfriend and threatening her with a gun, for auctioning various artistic items, for a planned celebrity pay-per-view fighting match, which was canceled, and for a CNN interview immediately following the Michael Dunn uh, trial where Michael Dunn actually was found guilty. 
Now, Zimmerman's comments about beating up Jay-Z and feeding him to the alligators, man, that took me back. That took me back. Growing up in the central part of Florida, some of the stories that you hear and some, I mean, some of the wise, wives tales and just things that your parents teach you when you're out in the neighborhood playing is if you see an alligator, this is in my city. I don't know about any other central Florida city, but if you see an alligator run and run zigzag, this is steeped in so much, just even having to, to tell your children this is steeped in so much cultural, uh, connected racism. <laughs> it is. Why? Because in most of these cities, there's a history of alligator farms in my home, hometown in particular, and even on some church fans. And you can find these images online. I am actually going to try to find them and, and upload them to this, uh, to this video. You can see where black children were uh, used as alligator bait. So the whole racial undertone of that particular statement just really got to me. And so now, here are excerpts of the foreword to my book, Portraits of Trayvon. It could have been my brother. He graduated high school in 1985 and went to the army. I was only in the fifth grade and mommy and daddy had just finalized their divorce. It could have been me. By the time Desert Storm hit, my brother was deployed there and I was in high school. During those years, my fall term was spent in marching band and the spring was full of outings with friends. Some outings were pleasant and some others not so. With the tension from the Rodney King incident and the ensuing LA riots, I imagine cities across the country were hotbeds for racial profiling and racist debauchery. Even among my generation, which was Bill Dunn's Romani at the time, meaning coming of age, the tension was mounting and seemingly either rekindled or uncovered. Progress had not truly been made, and it was evident. It could have been me once running for my life, running for freedom from patty rollers. Instead, I was being confronted continually by patty roller demons who still roam the southern dirt and clay the communities, looking to impress oppression upon a freed mind and freed soul. It could have been me. It could have been you. It was most recently and most widely known, Trayvon Martin, who in his high school years made his transition at the hands of another. Another who made a snap judgment. Another who acted prematurely. Another who, we know, disobeyed the orders of authoritative dispatchers. Another who ended a life before it even had time to really know life. Another. It could have been me, but it was my friend, Sarah, who was struck in the eye by a police officer with a blind nightstick to tame a riot that had not yet begun. It was she who lied there on the sidewalk in her own teenage blood while I screamed and raised my teenage voice at the paramedics, the injustice that knocked her flat on her back. Instead, it was me and my 1971 pea green Plymouth duster my daddy gave me that was pulled over by five different police vehicles supposedly for a blown taillight. It was me who spoke out and called out loudly the name of Jesus in the midst of their injustice to me. It was me who they suddenly left alone in pursuit of some other supposed culprits. It was me who was spared. 
Instead, it was me, along with my high school band director, a black man, who was harassed by police officers as we left campus after a band competition. He knew their tactics all too well. He was all too familiar, especially when they refused to accept his campus identification card. Spared yet again. There is work to do. There are stories to be told. There is justice to be served. When it could have been me, with each one of them, well, it was me too, all along. Portraits of Trayvon was birthed after the Trayvon Martin incident and as I reflected upon my own life. While it is a matter of opinion for some, it is a matter of fact for others. It was him. It was me. I am Trayvon Martin. All right, that was the forward to my book, Portraits of Trayvon. Now, since the incident, the nation has revisited its history and dynamics regarding race and perception, as well as the just and unjust application of laws and policing procedures that are utilized to govern our communities. And most recently, we have seen that, seen that with the Take a Knee movement. Now, furthermore, in response to a well-known media personality's comments regarding Trayvon Martin's hoodie as the possible immediate cause of his suspicion and ultimately his demise, <laughs> Trayvon's parents and empathizing community groups launched campaigns for justice, first demanding the arrest of George Zimmerman, who had not immediately you know, been arrested at that time, and secondly, demanding due process with charging, convicting, and sentencing uh, him for uh, the incident that led to Trayvon's death. And of course, we know he was not convicted. Nevertheless, the rallying cry as we gathered in various facilities and marched in cities all over the country was hoodies up. We still here, and we ain't going nowhere. Well, literally, it's getting late in the evening, and the sun is going down. Can you hear the children playing on the playground? I'm in my neighborhood. Waterways in my neighborhood now with some fencing but it wasn't always this way this is why we were told if you see an alligator run run zigzag because at any time one of these alligators can come out of one of these channels one of these waterways and chase us but again the comment was definitely steeped in old Southern Central Florida racism and hatred. It's getting late in the evening, Saints. And the sun's going down. This has been episode 12 of the Literary Minute with me, Professor Stephanie Johnson, also known as The Right, W-R-I-T-E, Professor. Now remember, reading is lit, so be lit. <laughs>